came to the world you created, trading your crown for a cross. You willingly died, your innocent life paid the cost. The counting your status says nothing. The King of all kings came to serve. Washing my feet, covering me with your love. If one of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. treasure the one that I can't live without here at your feet my desires and dreams I lay to um, there are two lines that really stick out to me and it's um, gold and silver you can take it all I want is you my Lord 
And I think a lot of times we let ourselves get distracted by school or work or friends or our phones or anything like that and we lose focus on God. And so as we sing this song, I just want you guys to think about things that are um, blocking you from God and, and ways that you can focus on God more.
through 2. It says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. to remember the fantastic grace that you have for us and that you leave our hearts open to the lessons that you have in our everyday lives and in this chapel. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.
Manuel. Yes, he is. So on Tuesday, we had the opportunity to hear from three students from the personal assessment class sharing their servant leader stories. And today we continue that uh, as Jason, Daryl, and Grant are going to sh be sharing their stories with you. Now remember, uh, the six students who were selected were selected by the students in the class after hearing all of them. There were participants both online and on campus. And uh, in fact, Daryl, because he's in the language classes at the same time, was actually an online student for this, uh, this portion of, of the class, but uh, was able to present in person. Uh, anyhow, uh, without further ado, we're gonna get started. Hey, I don't actually know exactly where to put this. I'm just gonna assume it's here and you guys can hear me. I'm also gonna try not to wander in front of them. Um, so I actually want to start off with a little bit of confession, and it might be news to some of you, and it might be new, not be news to others. But uh, I'm a little bit, just a little bit, of a cocky jerk. Uh, see, like, there's three people in the audience right now that are like, really? No way. And everyone else is like, Jason, we knew that. Move on. I want to get to lunch. Um, and that's fine. See, I've been trying to work on it. I think the Holy Spirit's been trying to work on it in me, and, and hopefully it will get better through the years, you know? Um, but I just want to tell you a little bit of a story about me being a cocky jerk that maybe will give you a little bit more insight into my personality. Some of you might remember that a few months ago, we gathered all the preaching students after chapel right there where that torch is in the middle of the room, and we took a picture. And during that process, I discovered that I am the shortest member of the preaching program in any grade. Like, notably, like several inches. Jake Case also noticed this and was torturing me about it all the way to our next class. We were just about to the door, and he looks at me. He says, hey, shorty, how's it feel to be the shortest member of the preaching class? And I turned around, and I looked at him, and I said, Jake, you know, I'm okay with being the shortest member of the preaching class, because I'm the best. <laughs> and God has a funny way of working, because right as I said that, looking down this hallway over here on my left, your right, uh, Grant Roth rounded the corner. <laughs> and he didn't hear what I said. He just looked at me. He just did the Grant Roth thing, though. And I made eye contact with him, and in the back of my head, I didn't say it out loud, I said, I'm okay with being the shortest member of the preaching program, because I'm the second best preacher. <laughs> in reality, my entire life, I've been pretty cocky. I've been pretty self-confident. I've always been attracted to leadership positions, too. I mean, I was a captain of the varsity wrestling team my junior and senior year. I was a super popular football player. I had different uh, officer positions in like three different clubs throughout my high school experience. I was a student leader in the youth ministry. I was a member of the worship group and I preached three or four times before I even got out of high school. I was always attracted to leadership positions and I always saw myself as someone who naturally thrived in the environment. I said, I said to myself and to others that things just came naturally to me. I was just good at things. And I got pretty cocky about it, and I kind of carried that attitude into my college experience. So when I got here, I was looking at the different ministries, and I had to get involved with some sort of student ministry, and I got involved with homeless ministry. Now, most of you guys at this point probably don't even realize I was ever involved in that ministry because I've been out of it for a few years. But as I came in, I came in as a volunteer, I pretty quickly became a group leader, and I got to watch two different ministry leaders really take over, really lead that ministry, two people that I really actually admire. The first one is Kyle Ball. And most of you guys don't actually know Kyle Ball, but Kyle Ball's leadership style was like drill sergeant meets Joseph Stalin. Um, in the best way possible, I promise. But he just ran that ministry with this sort of... Uh, this preciseness that I admired. He always knew what he wanted to do, always knew what he wanted to say. He always seemed to be perfectly well organized. It, it was really impressive to watch. And then after him, Bill took over. And a lot of you guys don't know Bill, which is really a shame, but Bill kind of ran it like he was everyone's dad. You know, he could just make you feel really, really comfortable and really, really loved and really, really seen, 
or really uncomfortable and he wouldn't notice it at all, but it was just part of his charm. And I admired Bill's leadership style too. And as I was watching these guys and volunteering and being a group leader within the, within the ministry, I saw them and I thought, I can combine that preciseness of Kyle and that relationship building that Bill has with my natural leadership ability, and I could do great things with this ministry. Not if, but when I get to lead it. I honestly thought that to myself. Eventually, I did get my shot. Bill kind of stepped down for personal reasons, and he put me and Jeremiah Webb as co-leaders of the ministry. Now, if you were in the ministry at that time, I wouldn't blame you if you didn't realize that Jeremiah was my co-leader, because I kind of pushed him off to the side and kind of kind of took over things for myself. I'm really sorry, <laughs> Jeremiah, that I co-opted the ministry from you. But it was just part of who I was at that point in my life. I kind of pushed him down so I could elevate myself, because that sounds Christ-like, right? And then I discovered a few things about myself that, honestly, I wish I didn't have to discover. I discovered that I had no idea about what kind of personality I have and what the weaknesses of that personality are. I discovered that I have no idea how to lead and organize a ministry. And I discovered that I can't get uh, volunteers to not hate me, let alone learn to inspire them. I just didn't have that ability in my repertoire at that point. When I first took over the ministry, there weren't very many volunteers, but as I came in and there was a new freshman class coming in that fall semester, I went and I spoke to them, and I think I'm an okay speaker, and I convinced a lot of them to come out and join the homeless ministry. So when I first took off with it, we had somewhere between 30 and 40 volunteers. It was a massive group. But every meeting kind of went something like this. We'd meet up in the lobby out here before we headed out to Columbia, and everyone would be kind of loud and talking, and instead of trying to like get everyone's attention gently, I'd stand up on a chair, I'd be like, hey, yo, shut up! Look, I, hey, hey, Garrett, I swear, it was always Garrett, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, Garrett, I swear, if you do not shut your mouth, I will drag you back to New Mexico and hand you off to your mother. <laughs> it's just the way it went, and honestly, a lot of people started to resent me because of the way that I interacted with the ministry, and I don't blame them at all. Probably the most common conversation I had during that period of time was people coming up to me especially after I had resigned from this position and kind of taken over different ministries, they'd come up to me and they'd say, Jason, I really used to think you were a massive butt, and now I know you're just kind of a butt, and I'm okay with you. I had that conversation a lot because people just really disliked me because of the way I was running this ministry. But as a result of my aggressiveness, the ministry went from 30 or 40 to 20 or 30, And by the time that I stepped down and really handed things off to Jeremiah, we had somewhere between like six and ten volunteers on a weekly basis. Most of them weren't actually super consistent. They kind of rotate, come in once or twice a month. So I kind of took this ministry that at least the first couple weeks I was there was really thriving and just kind of ground it into the dirt. Because I had no self-awareness, because I had no leadership training. And I thought that I was just good enough as is. I had all the natural ability I needed to lead this ministry and just take it to new heights. See, I discovered something. It's a lesson that I hope that you guys can get from my story instead of experiencing yourself, which is if you wait to prepare yourself until you step into a ministry role, until you're a pastor or a youth minister or an elder or a nonprofit director, or an entrepreneur, or a businessman, or a CEO, or whatever you're going to do after college, if you wait until you step into that position to learn how to do it, you're going to crash, and you're going to burn just like I did, or maybe even worse. See, I think there's actually a scripture that relates to this pretty well. It's Proverbs 21, 31. It says, a horse is prepared for the day of battle, but victory comes from the Lord. And you may ask, Jason, what does this have to do with your story? What does this have to do with me? What does this have to do with you? And the answer is, God thinks we look like horses. Thank you for your time. <laughs> that was a really dumb joke. I'm sorry. I was hoping it would land. It was, eh. But uh, now when you read that verse, at least when I read that verse, then you're reminded of 
what, of, of ancient warfare. They had to feed their horses, they had to water their horses, uh, give them armor and saddles and whatnot so they could ride them into battle. They had to prepare. And today, when you step into friendships and ministries and evangelism situations and businesses and marriage, you have to prepare, just like they prepared for war, because believe me, all those things feel like a battle sometimes, and there's good reason for that. God expects you to prepare, and if you do, if you prepare correct, correctly and you're within his will, he will give you what? He will give you victory, just like he gave victory to Israel time and time and time again. See, when I stepped into that role in homeless ministry, I was not prepared. The horses were not prepared for battle, so I crashed and I burned. But I've learned since then that I have to build my leadership. I have to learn, how do you deal with volunteers? How do you interact with people that don't like you? How do you respond to critics? How do you put checks and balances on yourself so you don't run people over? And I've learned those things, and I continue to learn those things so that hopefully, the next time I get an opportunity to lead, I'll be much more successful. Now, I'm a preacher. Supposnik has built into my brain that any time that you're speaking, you have to boil it down to one simple statement. So you guys get nothing else from my entire presentation today. Remember this. You have to learn before you can lead. Thank you. Well, I look forward to seeing what uh, God will continue to be preparing in my life um, because this story um, dealt with something in my past um, and I have to kind of set the stage just a little bit. So my family, thank goodness, I love how my parents helped to raise me. They made sure that I would not be spoiled. So there was a lot of times that I would really want something, and they made sure that I didn't always get it. But when they did give me something, it was definitely treasured. It was treasured greatly to the fact that it was hard for me to share. It was very hard for me to give anything away, even if it was the smallest thing of, let's see, when we start to hoard things, sometimes it's dealing with even, I saved this candy wrapper because it was a name brand candy wrapper. I mean, it was so bad. I continued to save and hoard everything, especially if it was name brand because I thought it had value. I thought it meant something. So it made it even more difficult for me to give that away. That's a little bit of a background coming up to what happened freshman year. Freshman year, we're here at school. And like many freshmen, um, you know, we're walking down the hall because we're trying to figure out what do we do with our extra time that we have, even though sometimes it's not extra time, it's just wanting to procrastinate. But uh, we were walking down the hall, and there was this room that had a lot of good noise going on, and I, of course, drawn to that. And so I go over to that room, and there's a couple of guys sitting in there, and they just came back from a T-bell run. And I was like, what's on earth is T-bell? Uh, I didn't realize until coming to the Centro that that is, of course, Taco Bell. So the famous T-Bell runs, and they came in, and they were getting ready to enjoy this nice new Taco Bell burrito or whatever else they had ordered. And I came in, and I was just sitting there, and I was just hearing their great conversation, and this man named Matt Renault. Mm -hmm, exactly. Matt Renault immediately saw me at the door, and he invited me in. And I was so excited to be able to just be a part of all of these guys who were juniors and seniors. And I just wanted to know what they were up to. And so, of course, curious as I was, um, seeing that they had Taco Bell, I was like, what would you guys get? I didn't know how to start a conversation. Uh, and so Matt Renault was like, well, I got a chick uh, chicken quesarito. And I was like, a quesarito? Actually, I didn't even pronounce it right the first three times. Took a while, but finally I figured out what a quesarito was, and I said, okay, what is it? So he tried to describe about this nice cheesy layer on the outside that's wrapped along inside this other burrito that's nice filled with chicken and everything else. And I was like, okay. He's like, you've never experienced one before. And I was like, no. And he just like grabs it in his bag, tosses me one, and says, here. And I like froze, just looked at him. And he's like, have it. I was like, a bite? He's like, no, the whole thing. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Because uh, to me, that's just shocking that somebody would actually give their own possession over so quickly, willingly. That's something that they enjoyed and loved. And so I went ahead, and I took the first bite, and I watched Matt's eyes just sit there in shock and just all ready for me to experience what I was about to experience. And I took a bite, and I had chills. I had chills <laughs> not because just 
of him sharing this, but it was actually good. And so I sat there, and I was like, oh, my goodness. So part of me was thinking, this is really good. And I looked at him reassuringly and grateful that I was going to have a second bite. Um, but then the other side of me was saying, this man was willing to share something with me that he really enjoyed. And it wasn't just that. He was wanting to invite me into an experience that he was having. He was willing and ready to be able to offer up something else so that way he could invite people into a community, into an experience that he was sharing that he knew he loved. And I thought in my mind, and it has stuck with me ever since, this is what generosity looks like. This is what hospitality looks like. And you better bet throughout the rest of my time at Central, there's been times that I've been challenged greatly to be able to show just the smallest thing of hospitality, and that memory always comes up. I think Matt Renault showed me what hospitality looks like. And you better bet whenever, as being an RA, there's been multiple times that people come to my room on something that they need, by all means, I'll share no problem. But when it's something that I know they don't need, but they just want to be able to just take from me, and I'm like, <sighs> sure. It has always been a challenge. And I know sometimes that seems interesting because I know some people are like, Daryl, you're always willing to serve wherever. I'm willing to give my time. But for some reason, possessions have always been difficult for me to just hand over. And I've constantly been reminded that if I'm actually going to be a servant leader in God's kingdom, I'm going to have to learn generosity. I'm going to have to learn hospitality. Those have been two huge things that I've had to learn multiple times. And not just that, but it was out of a fear that I wouldn't have what I need later. So then I had to be reminded, no, 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 I can't be fearing every day if I'm going to have enough. Because I'm reminded that God will continue to provide exactly what I need. Look at the birds in the air, Matthew 6. Or the one that hits me harder was uh, in, also in Matthew 6 when it would talk about don't be storing up treasures here on earth that will be decay and uh, subject to moth and everything else. But store up your treasures in heaven. That servant leader heart, that's where that's going to be happening at. That's what I needed to be able to recognize that I needed humility. That I needed to be humbled to be able to actually be a servant leader in God's kingdom. And that is something that I continue to remember and am refreshed about every day. So trust God, that's what I had to learn in humility, to be able to serve, to be able to be generous and hospitable. But the biggest thing is, no matter how small that moment was of sharing a quesarito, no matter how small the moment, it left a lasting impact. And sometimes, you guys were, well, you're all going to be faced with that at some point. Know that those smallest moments may leave a lasting impact, impact that will change that person's life that they will continue to hold on to. Uh, so I'm going to do my best to keep this from sounding like a sermon, uh, which is going to be difficult for me because if you know me at all, you know that I really love to preach. It's something that I'm super passionate about, something that I uh, get really excited about doing. Um, and so from my sophomore year to the beginning of this year, my senior year, I was kind of like an interim preacher on the weekends at a, uh, a little church about an hour and a half away. And I would uh, go to this church every single week, and I'd be really, really excited about getting up on that stage to preach a message. And all throughout the week prior to me preaching, I would be uh, working tirelessly, essentially, uh, to preach the best possible sermon that I could. And that's good. But it, it was almost an obsession for me to where during the week I would fill every uh, open uh, minute or hour in my schedule with sermon prep. I'd be studying a text or I would be writing a manuscript or then I would be recrafting statements and I would just be trying to figure out the best possible way to say something so that it could make the biggest impact possible. Um, so throughout the week I would be uh, sitting in my room while I'm typing up a sermon and I'd be envisioning uh, how the crowd was going to respond. The crowd, I say crowd, it was 30 people. But uh, I, I would think about maybe someone will shed a tear at this moment. Or maybe when I deliver this line like, like this, someone will give me that hmm of approval. 
You know what I'm talking about? Like when the preacher makes a good point and you're like, mm, that's good. That's, uh, that's, that's like cocaine for preachers. I don't know if I can say that. But, uh, but during the week, not, I also don't, uh, n never mind. Uh, <laughs> but during the week, I'd be thinking about all those sorts of things about how I was going to get up and I was going to do uh, the best job that I could to preach the best sermon to make the biggest impact. And all I was thinking about was having this impressive ministry performance is what I'm going to call it, an impressive performance. And all the while, when I would uh, get up and preach those sermons, there was a woman named Esther Lynn who sat near the back in one of the back pews at the church. And uh, Esther Lynn, I mean, she sat through all my sermons. She heard all of the cleverly crafted statements that I had. She heard, she heard all of my sermons. She saw me do first-person sermons and, and all these different models to try and impress the crowd. And she heard all of that for the first six months of my ministry there. But after the first six months, uh, she stopped showing up. And if I'm honest, this sounds bad, but I didn't really recognize that she stopped showing up to church. It was a small church I should have recognized. Uh, but she, she wasn't attending the church anymore, and then for about six months she wasn't there. But I didn't notice, because the only interaction I ever had with her was at the back of this little church. After the service was over, I would go stand near the door, and then as people were leaving, I would shake their hands and, and kind of say, hey, have a good week. And they'd walk out the door and go on with their lives, and I wouldn't see them until the next week. And that's kind of the relationship I had with Esther Lynn. She would always come by, and then she would shake my hand, and then she'd go, you have cold hands. And that's what old women sound like if you've never met one before. And, uh, but she would tell me I have cold hands, and I'd say, oh, well, that's, that's funny, like, thanks or something. I, don't, I didn't know how to respond. And then I would uh, say, have a good week, and she'd go on with her week, and I wouldn't see her again. But after that first six months of me being at this church, she stopped showing up. I didn't recognize and so she didn't show up for another six months. And so a year into my ministry, another lady comes up to me from that church, and she says, hey, Grant, Esther Lynn has been moved to the nursing home down the street. And she's not doing very well. She's only got a few weeks left to live, and she knows that she's been moved to that nursing home to basically die. And in that moment, I had two thoughts going through my mind. First, I was like, oh, I've never done a, a nursing home visit before, so I was nervous about that. I, I felt like it was going to be kind of awkward. And the second thought was, who is Esther Lynn? Because I completely forgot who this lady was. I couldn't, I couldn't put a name with a face or anything like that. Uh, so I was really nervous about doing that, but then Ronnie and I, uh, we went down to that nursing home uh, after church that day, and I went up to the front desk, and I said, hey, I'm looking for Esther Lynn, and they pointed me to this frail um, older woman sitting in a chair in the cafeteria. And so I, I walked and I sat down right across from her and she had a lunch, lunch tray in front of her. And I looked her in the face and when I looked at her face, I remembered who she was. And I started to recognize, oh, this is that woman that I would talk to at the back of the church. But she looked a lot different. She had, her body was deteriorating uh, and her, her hair was, was white and her eyes were a little bit um, glazed over, I guess. She looked different, and, but I recognized who she was in that moment. And so we, uh, we spent some time talking there, and uh, about halfway through our conversation, I said, hey, Esther Lynn, would you want me to pray for you? And when I said that, she reached out, and she grabbed my hand, and she said, yes, please pray for me. But after she grabbed my hand, she says, your hands aren't so cold anymore. And then it was kind of that moment where I was like, oh, yeah, that was the conversation that we used to have all the time. And, and in that moment where she reaches out and, and, and starts talking about my hands, we, we, start, we went on with that conversation, and we spent most of that conversation. This was the last time I ever talked to this woman before she died. Um, and we spent most of that conversation talking about some silly interaction that we had at the back of church, and it would last five seconds every Sunday. But that's what we talked about most of the time. We talked about how my hands were cold. We talked about this personal interaction that we had, and this woman had sat through all of my sermons. She had sat through every single time that I got up and, and preached some sermon, and I delivered some line as best as I could. She sat through all my impressive performances, but she didn't care about that in that moment. All she wanted to talk about was some silly personal interaction. And, and in that moment, I recognized the, the truth that I want to share with you guys today. I recognized this, this lesson that my personal interactions, your personal interactions, are much more important than our impressive performances. 
And I think we all want to have those impressive performances. If you're a preacher, you want to preach in front of thousands of people. If you're a counselor, you want to say the right thing at the right time in that counseling session so that married couple can have that breakthrough in their marriage and, and their relationship can be repaired. Or if you're a cross-cultural major, you want to go overseas and you want to convert a whole tribe to Christ and, and baptize a bunch of people in an African river or something. Or if you're a youth ministry major, you want to speak at CIY. You want to do big things. You want to make an impact for the kingdom of God. You want to have an impressive performance. But what I learned is that our biggest opportunity for impact is in those, those personal interactions that we have with people. Because if we're not loving and serving people in those seemingly meaningless and menial moments, then it doesn't matter. Nothing else we do under the spotlight matters. And there's a verse, uh, there's a passage in 1 Corinthians that goes along with this, and it, it really expresses this truth. Paul writes, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but I don't have love, I'm just a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give all that I have to the poor, and I give my body over to hardship, that I may boast, but I don't have love, and I am nothing. And what I, I realized, reflecting on this, is really that if we want to be the servant leaders that this school is supposed to be developing, if we want to go out and be servant leaders who are going to make a difference in this world, we need to be loving and serving people, not just by standing up here with a microphone, but we have to be doing it in those personal interactions that we have with people, in those ordinary moments. Because... I think it's those ordinary moments that God often uses to make the most extraordinary impact. Great job, guys. Um, these are some great stories. It's even better hearing them the second time. I really appreciate it. Um, so we've just got a couple minutes left. But I noticed, learn before you leave. Um, and then... Lessons about generosity and hospitality from somebody who was having a, a very personal, friendly moment with you. Uh, that, that's, that's interesting that all of these intertwine in this idea of the personal interactions preceding in importance the, uh, the perfect message, the perfect moment that we craft. Uh, do, I, do any of the three of you have maybe one sentence that kind of stood out that God put on your heart as you shared this? Because it really was a three-point message. It was really well done, so, which is completely by chance. So any thoughts? This is rare that the three of you are quiet. This is awesome. All right, that alone may be a God moment. Well, tell you what, I know that Dr. Fincher uh, is going to come up and share for just a moment uh, with, with the school. Let's give these guys a round of applause. They did a great job. Well, we appreciate our seniors who are processing the career that they had here and the lessons that they learned. Just boiling down a few of those for you is a great way to help you start looking for those moments yourself as you are going through the semester and going through your first year or second year or third year at school. Those lessons that stick with you today are something that you can draw upon for years and years to come. I have just a, a few announcements for you uh, real quick, a couple things to update you on that I wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page about. The first thing I wanted to tell you about is just a little bit of an update uh, on our friends in Cincinnati and our work there. Um, as you know, I've, I've been uh, gone a little bit more, and some of our other people here have been working uh, there to work on our, on our future plans. Uh, continue to pray for the students there as well as the staff members. Um, they are planning a commencement ceremony for December 14th, and I know that will be a, a time of you know, bittersweet emotion uh, as they finish that semester. So we want to pray for our friends there and pray for the students that will be continuing. Many of them will be in online uh, programs with us. Some of them will be at the site there. Some of them will be um, coming here. So we want to keep praying for them as they're making their decisions and uh, making their plans uh, for the coming semester and the coming years. I want to tell you about um, one particular
prayer request that I want us to lift up here as we close. Uh, in Michigan is a man, a former board member, ongoing supporter of our school, who is coming near to the uh, end of his life. And as Grant was telling his story about visiting uh, in the nursing home, it, it reminds me of how much ministry takes place at the point of death, how many opportunities there are to give people hope and comfort in the moments as they face their eternity. This very godly and generous man is uh, hopefully coming home today from the hospital, but uh, doesn't have much time to go. Um, his family is coming together next week for Thanksgiving with him. And their hope is to share the week together, the last week together. Uh, they have not been together under the same roof for a couple of years now. And this is an opportunity for them to have the, the best possible last memories they can have. So if you'll pray for this family, we'll, we'll lift them up here at the end, this family in Michigan, that, that God will grant them that grace of a week at Thanksgiving, even though they know that eternity is near, that they can have some time on this earth to enjoy. And I also want to pray for you guys as you go home for a week at Thanksgiving. I understand that some of you will be in places where, you know, you're very comfortable and, and uh, you have lots of faith around you, and that's great. Some of our students go home to places that uh, don't have that kind of experience. And, and for you, it's an opportunity for you to either witness or, or to try to just um, stand firm in the midst of people who are not sympathetic with your own situation, with your own priorities. So we want to pray for, for you all as you are making your uh, travel over the next few days uh, for safety, for you to have uh, a peaceful and joyful experience. Be grateful for the family that you're uh, blessed with and have the opportunity to speak well to them and share what you've been learning here. And finally, I want us to pray for the transitions that we are experiencing here at Central. As you know, we're uh, looking at different candidates for different openings that we have. Our staff is pulling together well, not only to, to cover several bases and make pr uh, preparatory plans, but also to identify the next people that can help in various areas. And some of those candidates will be coming in the next couple of weeks, and others are being identified now. So I just want you to pray for those things, uh, too, as we close this time. Uh, this part of the semester and head out for Thanksgiving. Those things are weighing on several people's hearts, and we want to pray for God to provide peace and strength in them. Would you stand with me? We're going to lift these things up in prayer, and, uh, and then we'll be dismissed. Lord, we do lift up our friends in Cincinnati and those students and staff members there who are working towards a resolution of this semester and a transition in their lives. We pray for them as they make their plans. We pray for the commencement ceremony next month to bring some, some joy and some uh, resolution, but also for them as they are planning whether to, to transfer here or go into other directions just to give them wisdom and peace. Lord, we do want to lift up our, our friend in Michigan and his family in this time of suffering, in this time of uncertainty about his future here on earth. We thank you that his family does have certainty of eternity and his uh, relationship with, with Christ. And I pray for them to have the kind of week that, that they have been hoping for, where they can share together without uh, trips to the hospital or, or problems at home or interruptions, that they can have those moments together as children and grandchildren uh, to remember uh, with joy the faith that they have and the love that they have for one another. God, we do want to lift up our students as they travel for Thanksgiving, different places. Uh, keep your hand of protection on them. Keep their hearts strong uh, so that they can come back here ready to finish this semester well. In the meantime, to, to be able to, to relate and, and bring uh, joy and gratitude to their family members, some of whom may not see it anywhere else. So give them success in that. And Father, we do pray for the transitions that uh, we are facing here in some of our positions. We pray that you'll provide the right, uh, the right people that in the coming weeks our interviews and our opportunities to discuss with one another can provide insight and help us to make a, uh, a good decision on each of these areas that will, that will help us as a staff to, to be strong and to work together to serve uh, the students and to serve you. We pray these things in the name of Christ.
Thank you all for helping us with the chairs.